Live from New York City, it's theCUBE. Covering CyberConnect 2017. Brought to you by Centrify and the Institute for Critical Infrastructure Technologies. Hey, welcome back everyone. Live here in New York, just theCUBE's exclusive coverage of Centrify's CyberConnect 2017 presented by Centrify. It's an industry event that Centrify is underwriting, but it's really not a Centrify event. It's really where industry and government are coming together to talk about best practices, architecture, how to solve the biggest crisis of our generation in the computer industry, and that is security. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Dave Vellante. Our next guest, David McNeely, who's the Vice President of Product Strategy with Centrify. Welcome to theCUBE. <laughs> Great, thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. Really uh, uh, impressed by Centrify's approach here. You're underwriting the event, but it's not a Centrify commercial. Right. This is about the core issues of community coming together, the culture of tech. Right. You run the product. You got some <clears> great <throat> props from the general on stage. You guys are foundational. What does that mean when he said that Centrify could be a foundational element for solving this problem? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with, if you look at the problems that people are facing, it's uh, the breaches are misusing uh, computers in order to, to use your account. Um, and if your account is authorized to go gain access to a particular resource, uh, whether that be servers or databases, uh, somehow the software and the systems that we put in place and even some of the policies need to be uh, retrofitted in order to go back and make sure that it really is a human that's gaining access to things and not malware. Uh, running around the network with uh, you know, a compromised credential. Um, so we, we've been spending a lot more time trying to help customers uh, eliminate the use of passwords, try to move to stronger authentication. Um, most of the regulations now start talking about strong authentication, but yeah. then what does that really mean? Yeah. Uh, is, is it just, uh, it can't just be a one-time passcode delivered to your phone. They yeah. figured out ways to, to break into that. Certificates have been hacked and data just came out. I saw a story that's uh, even before Stuxnet, uh, certificate authorities were being compromised mm -hmm. even before the big worm hit in, the, in that, that kind of, he calls the atom bomb of, of malware. But this is the new trend that we're seeing is that the independent credentials of a user <coughs> is being authentically compromised. Right. With right. the Equifax, all these breaches where all personal information's out there. This is a growth area for the hacks where people are actually getting compromised emails and sending them. Yeah, so exactly. How do you know it's not a fake account if you think it's your friend? Exactly. That's so the, the growth area, right? And, and the biggest problem is uh, trying to make sure that, you know, if you, if you do allow somebody to use like my device here to gain access to my mail account, how do we make it stronger? How do we make sure that it really is David that's, that's logged onto the account? Um, if you think about it, my laptop, my iPad, my phone, all authenticate and access the same email account. Um, and if that's only protected with a password, then how good is that? Uh, how hard is it to break uh, passwords? You know, so we're starting to challenge a lot of base assumptions about um, yeah. different ways to do security, because uh, you know, if you look at some of the tools that the hackers have, their tooling's getting better all the time. So we, um, oh, go ahead, sorry, finish I'm your thoughts. I'm just going to say that you know, tools like their Hashcat can break um, you know, passwords like hmm. millions and millions a second, so it's, Kind of You're hacked basically tools. out there. Yeah. When you and talk about eliminating passwords, are you talking about doing things other than just passwords or you mean eliminating passwords? I mean eliminating passwords. So how does um, that work? So th the way that works is you have to have a stronger uh, vetting process around who the, the person is. Um, and this is actually going to be a challenge uh, as people start looking at, okay, <laughs> how, do you, how do you vet a person? We ask them a whole bunch of questions, mother's maiden name, where you lived, uh, other stuff, all this data that Equifax has. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but we ask you all that has. information to find out, is it really you? Um, but th really, the, the best way to do it now is going to be uh, to go back to government issued IDs because they have a vetting process or they're establishing an identity for you. You've got a driver's license, we all have social security numbers, uh, maybe a passport. Uh, that kind of information is really the only way to start making sure it really is me. This is the, the w where you start, and then the, the next place is assigning a, a stronger credential. So there's a way to get a strong credential onto your mobile device. Uh, that The issuance process itself generates the first, the, the key pair inside the device um, in a protected place that uh, can't be compromised because it's part of the hardware, part of the chip, the processor that runs the, the phone. And that uh, starts acting as strong as, uh, I would say, a smart card. Uh, in the government, they call it derived credentials. But uh, it's, it's kind of new technology. I mean, NIST has had described documentation on how to make that work for quite some time. But 
actually implementing it and delivering it as a solution that can be used for authentication to other things is what's kind of new here. A big theme of your talk tomorrow is on designing this in. So right. with all this infrastructure out there, I, I presume you can't just bolt this stuff on and spread it, you know, peanut butter spread it across. Exactly, right. So how do we, how do we solve that problem? <laughs> it's just going to take time and, well, and, that's and actually, new infrastructure, um, modernization? Or? So Dr. Ron Ross is going to be joining me tomorrow and uh, he's from the NIST and we'll be talking with him about um, some of the security frameworks that they've created. So there's a cybersecurity framework, um, there's also other guidance uh, that they've created, uh, the NIST 800-160, that describe how to start building security in from the very start. Mm -hmm. So we actually have to back all the way up to the app developer and the operating system developers and get them to design security into the applications and also into the operating systems uh, in such a way that you can trust the OS. Um, application that's sitting on top of an untrusted operating system is not that very good, so you know, the applications have to be sitting on top of trusted operating systems. And then we'll probably get into a little bit of the newer technology. I'm starting to find a lot of our customers that move to cloud-based infrastructures uh, starting to move their applications into containers, uh, where there's a container around the application, and it actually is not bound as heavily to the OS, so that I can deploy as many of these app containers as I want and start uh, scaling those out. So separate the workload from some of the infrastructure. Right. You're kind of seeing that trend? Exactly. Um, and that, that changes a whole lot of the way we look at security. So now your security boundary is not the machine or the computer, it's, it's now the application yeah. container. So, so you run the product strategist. This isn't, you're like the, have the keys to the kingdom at Centrify, but also we heard today that it's a moving train, this business. It's not like you can lock into something. Right. Dave calls it the silver bullet. It's hard to get a silver bullet in security. How do you balance the speed of the game of the product strategy, and how do you guys deal with bringing a customer solution to the market yeah. that has an architectural scalability to it, right? So, because that's the challenge. I'm a slow enterprise, but I mm -hmm. want to implement a product. I don't want to be obsolete by the time I roll it out. I need to have a scalable solution that can give me the headroom and flexibility. So you're bringing a lot to the <coughs> table. Explain that what, what's going on in that dynamic. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, I, I try as much as possible to adhere to standards where they exist. Uh, and push and promote those. Like, um, you know, on the authentication side of things, um, for the longest time we used LDAP and Kerberos uh, to authenticate computers to Active Directory. Now almost all the web app developers are using SAML or uh, OpenID Connect or OAuth uh, 2 as a mechanism for authenticating the applications. Um, and just keeping up with standards like that is, is one of the best ways. That way, uh, the technology and tool that we deliver just have APIs that the app developers can go back and use and take advantage of. So I wanted to follow up on that because I was going to ask you, isn't, isn't there a sort of an organizational friction in that you've got companies, if you've got to go back to the developers and, and the guys who are writing code around the OS, there's, a, there's an incentive from up top to go for fast profits, right? Get to market as soon as you, you can. Mm -hmm. um, but if I understand what you just said, if you're able to use open source standards or things like OAuth, that maybe could accelerate your, your time to market, but help me square that circle. Is there an inherent conflict between the desire mm -hmm. to get short-term profits versus designing in good security? Well, we do, I mean, it does take a little bit of time to design and build, deliver products, but as we've moved to cloud-based infrastructure, we're able to more rapidly deploy and release features. So part of uh, having a cloud service, we update that uh, every month, so every 30 days we've got a new version of that rolling out that's got new capabilities in it. Yeah. Um, part of adopting a agile delivery models. But everything that we deliver also has an API. So when we go back and talk to the customers and the developer at the customer organizations, we have a rich set of APIs that the cloud service exposes. If they uncover a, a use case or a situation uh, that requires something new or different that we don't have, then uh, that's when I go back to the product managers, engineering teams, and, and talk about you know, adding that new capability into the cloud service, which we can expect, you know, the, the monthly cadence helps me deliver that more rapidly to market. So as you look at the bell curve in, in the client base, how, how does it, how, what's the shape of those that are kind of on the cutting edge and doing, I mean, by definition, I shouldn't use the word, word, uh, term cutting edge, on the path mm -hmm. to designing in as you would prescribe, you know, what's it look like? Is it 2080, 199? <laughs> well, that's going to be hard to put a number on. Um, we do have a, a, you know, most of the customers are covering the basics, um, you know, with respect to consolidating identities, uh, moving to stronger authentication. 
I'm finding one of the areas that uh, the more mature companies are, uh, have adopted is this just-in-time notion, where uh, by default nobody has any rights to gain access to either systems or applications, and moving it to a workflow request access model. So that's the one that's a little bit newer that I would say fewer of my customers are using, but most everybody wants to adopt, because if you think about some of the attacks that have taken place, if I can get a piece of email to you and you think it's me and then you open up the attachment, um, at that point you are now infected. And the malware that's on your machine has the ability to use your account to start moving around and authenticating the things that you're authorized to get to. So if I could send that piece of email and accomplish that, um, I might target like uh, system administrators or database admins yeah. and go try to, to use their account because it's already authorized to go log on to the database servers which is what I'm trying to get to. Now Good. if we could flip it and say well, the, yeah, there's a database admin, but if he doesn't have permissions to go log on to anything right now, and he has to make a request, then the malware can't make the request, and can't get the approval of the manager um, in order to go gain access to the database. Does, now, again, I, I want to explore organizational friction. Does that slow down sort of the organization's ability to conduct business, and will there be pushback from the user base, or can you make that transparent? Uh, it does slow things down. I mean, it, it, we're talking <laughs> about a process. Is, right. yeah. So it's a choice that organizations have to change. make. Do you care about the, you know, the long term, you know, health of your company, but your brand, your revenues, or do you want to go and for that, the short term? And that is problem? one of the biggest challenges, is just, um, you know, we describe it in the software world as technical debt, um, you know, yeah. some more IT organizations may as well. It's just the way things happen and the processes by which people adhere to things. We find all too often that people will use a password vault, for example, and go check out, um, the administrator password or their Dash A account uh, that's authorized to log on any Windows computer in the entire network as an admin. Um, <laughs> and if they check it out and they get to use it all day long, it's like, okay, where did you put it? Did you put it in clipboard? Uh, malware knows how to get to your clipboard. <laughs> did you put it in a, a notepad document stored on your desktop? Uh, guess what, malware knows how to get to that. So now we've got uh, you know, a system by which people checked out a, a password and, and malware can get to that password and use it for the whole day. Okay, so maybe at the end of the day, the password vault can rotate the password so that it's not yeah. long lived, but see the process is what's wrong there, yeah. where yeah. we allow the humans to continue yeah. to do things in a bad way just because it's, it's easy. The human error is a huge part, and the yeah. administrators have their own identity systems have a big problem. Yeah. We're here with David McNeely, who's the Vice President of Product Strategy for Centrify. I got to get your take on Jim Ruth, the, C, uh, the Chief Security Officer for Aetna, who's on stage. Oh, yes. Great presentation. Awesome. He's really talking about the cutting edge things that he's doing, unconventional he says, but it's the only way for him to attack the problem. He did do a shout out for Centrify, so congratulations on that, but Thanks. he was getting at a whole new way to reimagine exactly. security, and he brought up civilizations crumble when you lose trust. It's a huge <laughs> issue, so how are you guys seeing that help you guys solve <laughs> problems with your customers? I mean, is Aetna a tell sign for which direction to go? Absolutely, I mean, if you think about the problem we just described earlier, where the sysadmin uh, now needs to make a, a workflow style request to gain access to a machine. The problem is that takes time and it involves humans and process change. It'd be a whole lot nicer, uh, and we've already been uh, delivering solutions that do this machine learning based, uh, behavior based access controls, yeah. right? And, and we tied it into our multi-factor authentication system. But the whole idea was to try to get the computers to make a decision based on behavior. Is it really David at the keyboard trying to gain access to yeah. a target application or a server? And the machine can learn by patterns and looking at the my historical access to go determine does it does that look and smell and feel like yeah. David? So machine um, learning, for right. example. And that's a huge part of it, right? Because if we can get the computers to make these decisions automatically, then we eliminate so much time that's being chewed up by humans and putting things into a queue and then waiting for somebody to investigate. What's the impact of machine learning on security, in your opinion? Is it massive in the sense of, I mean obviously it's, no, it's going to be significant, but what areas is it attacking? The speed of the solution, the amount of data it can go through, um, unique domain expertise to the applications, where is the aha moment for the machine learning value proposition? Well it's really going it, to, it's going to help us enormously in, on making more intelligent decisions. If you think about access control systems, they all make a decision based on did you supply the correct user ID and password, or credential, and do you have access to whatever uh, that resource is. But we only looked at two things, the authentication and an access policy. And these behavior-based systems, they look at a lot of other things, right? We're, he mentioned 60 different um, you know, attributes that they're looking at. 
and all of these attributes, we're looking at, you know, where's David's uh, iPad, what's the location of my laptop, which should be in the room upstairs, uh, my phone, you know, is nearby, and making sure that, you know, somebody's not trying to use my account from California, because there's no way I could get from here to California, yeah. you know, at, at a rapid pace. My, my final question for you, while we have one couple seconds left here, what is the value proposition for Centrify, if you had to bottom line the, the product strategy in a nutshell? Um, what? <laughs> kind of a tough one there, but. Identity, uh, <laughs> I mean, stop the breach is the tagline, but is it yeah. the identity, is it the tech, is it the Identity workflow? and access control, at the end of the day, we're trying to provide identity and access controls around uh, how a user accesses an application, how we access um, servers, privileged accounts, um, how you would access your mobile device and your mobile device accesses applications. Basically, if you think about uh, what defines an organization, identity, um, the humans that work at an organization and your rights to go gain access to applications is what links everything together because, um, you know, as you start adopting cloud services, as we've adopted mobile devices, there's no perimeter anymore really for the, the company. And identity makes up the, the, the definition and the boundary of the organization. All right, David McNeely, Vice President of Product Strategy Centrify. More live coverage here in New York City from theCUBE at CyberConnect 2017, the inaugural event. CUBE coverage continues after this short break. Stop.